cycle paced back and forth in front of the construction trailer and a very weird, worried look on his face. He was wringing his hands, saying over and over, see Fred, gotta see Fred. It's important. Where's Fred? See Fred. Must see Fred important. Where's Fred? It was like that every day, day in, day out. And I didn't handle it very well. Hi, I'm Pastor Tom, and I want to pass along a law, a painful lesson I learned many years ago, and it's a lesson that still hurts every time the Holy Spirit finds an occasion to remind me. I was working with a wonderful brother in the Lord a number of years ago on a large church remodeling project. You guessed it, Fred. Fred was a perfectionist, and subcontractors realized very quickly that they had better have the same dedication toward the, uh, the project that he did. Now, neither of us knew much about Michael, except that he came to church every Sunday and sat in the back with his mom. I guess he was somewhere in his mid-twenties, and as I look back now, Michael was autistic, which I didn't understand at the time. His brain functioned in a way that that it was removed from where the rest of us in the world was. For example, someone would tell Michael the date they were born, and his immediate reply would be, year, what year, got to know the year. He would barely spit out the air and he would shout, Friday. He was never wrong. That was about all we knew about Michael. Well, that and the fact that he was very quickly making a nuisance of himself around the construction site. He would wander around the construction site and we'd have to lead him out and tell him to stay away for his own safety. In frustration, I finally had a rather firm talk with Michael and told him, sadly, rather harshly, that he couldn't come near the job anymore. He was devastated, and as he turned to walk away, he continued to wring his hands. See Fred. Must see Fred important. Where's Fred? Must see Fred. It's important. Where's Fred? I hung my head. I felt about as big as an ant crawling past the toe of my boot. I did what was right, didn't I? After all, we couldn't have him hanging around, interrupting all the time, and maybe getting hurt, could we? Have you ever been in one of those places where God is making a point very clearly to you and he makes it, he makes certain that you don't miss it? Well, God began discussing the subject of grace with me and you know how he does it. Every time you turn around, the subject comes up again. Case in point, he reminds me about Michael frequently. Now, grace is a subject we can easily grab hold of. It's how we were saved by grace through faith. But fully understanding it is another thing altogether. Now, unfortunately, many never do truly understand God's grace. To them, it's something we get, and far too often, it's not something we give. In thinking back on that day, and sadly some others in my life, the Holy Spirit reminds me of something Solomon wrote, Ecclesiastes 10.12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor but the lips of a fool consume him. Grace comes from the root word that means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior, to bestow favor. Well, you get the idea, the exact opposite of my actions with Michael. Now, perhaps I should share a couple of other verses the Lord uses to gently remind me. Romans 12, 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And 1 Corinthians 1, 27. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. How often I've looked at grace as an inbound blessing and not an outbound one. It truly is easy to be gracious to those who are easy to love. You are generous to me, I'll be generous to you. But when it comes to those that, well, aren't so easy to love, it's a different story. It's almost uh, it's almost always a heart issue, isn't it? Well, at that moment, my heart was involved with bigger picture. We had a job to do and the schedule and the budget to meet. So in the heat of the moment, I withheld my grace. I didn't even think of the cost as my priorities were centered on my own issues. I still shudder to this day to think of the price that Michael paid. 
You know, it's sad, but we see it all the time. The pressures of the world are the very things that keep us focused on the world. Yes, we're in this world, but we're not to become part of it, adopting its way, its values. Unfortunately, however, we frequently let those pressures affect our business, our friendships, our family, and most importantly, our relationship with Jesus. If we're not constantly on guard, we find ourselves withholding our grace from others while desperately holding on to his grace. In our relationship with Jesus, the sole goal is to become more like him, to allow the Spirit to work in us and polish off the rough edges, to turn up the heat and scour the dregs from the bottom of our pot. And I'm learning a good measure of just how much progress has been made is by the amount of grace that I extend to others. Jesus didn't withhold his grace from anyone, but I have to admit that I have. That in itself is hard enough to face, now, but the more troubling issue is that I'm often caught so caught up in what I'm doing that I don't even realize I'm doing it. That especially shows up in how I relate with my family. Like with Michael, it's very easy to take those around you for granted. I'm so glad that Jesus did not take me for granted and look the other way when it came to his grace. So we finished up that day's work and went home without giving it another thought. Progress was being made, and we were pretty close to being on time and on budget. But the next morning, God had something in store for me, very special and very sobering. But I was sitting in the trailer when Fred walked in and sat down. He didn't say a word. I looked at him, and he was staring at a piece of notebook paper in his hand. I said, what's the problem? He handed me the paper, and as I began to read what was written, Fred leaned back in his chair and said, it's true, every one of them. To say I was flabbergasted doesn't even express it. There on that paper in his handwriting, Michael had written down a list of mistakes that had been made by the guys working on the job, every one of them. Oh, it wasn't that they would ultimately be discovered, but the added cost to repair them would have been significant. Fred looked at me and he smiled. He didn't miss a thing. The young man that nobody took seriously spotted every single mistake. Needless to say, things changed after that, and Michael was allowed to do an end-of-the-day uh, end inspection. Then I have to say the subcontractors began paying a little more close attention to their work, and they made Michael a part of the crew. Now, I have to admit that every time I think about that episode in my life, I get more than a little twinge of guilt. It still hurts. Grace. We hear it preached and we ask God for his grace all the time, never expecting to be refused. Why is it that somewhere between the inbox and the outbox that we file it away in one of our personal folders? We so easily ignore the fact that it goes hand in hand with one of the two commandments Jesus gave us. Mark 12, 30 and 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. God's grace was revealed to us in his son and the work he completed on the cross. Jesus is the complete and perfect embodiment of grace. By his grace and by only by his grace can we be restored in our relationship with the Father. But what do we do with that grace? A famous missionary to India, East, uh, East Stanley Jones, put his finger on it better than I ever could. Grace binds you with far stronger cords than the cords of duty or obligation can bind you. Grace is free, but when once you take it, you are bound forever to the giver and bound to catch the spirit of the giver. Like produces like. Grace makes you gracious. The giver makes you give. You know, perhaps when those opportunities arise and we're tempted to say, I can't do that, it might be best to remember that part of Christ's grace is his spirit, the spirit of grace that lives within the heart of every believer in Jesus. October 27th, 1944, Friday. Somebody very special told me that once, someone I look forward to spending eternity with. So, our challenge this week is to remind ourselves that grace is a two-way street. And for me, Michael, is a great reminder of just how God can humble us 
with his lessons in life. Now, thanks for joining us this morning and helping us share these weekly challenges with the Bride of Christ. We are all on the same journey from the cross to spiritual maturity, and we need each other along the way. God has given us every has given every one of us something special to use in blessing our fellow members of the bride. So until next Wednesday morning, have a great week in Jesus, and God bless.